Chapter Three of Planet of the Damned by Harry Harrison. Chapter Three. This time there was no way to hold the door. Igel didn't try. He stepped aside, and two men stumbled into the room. He walked out behind their backs without saying a word. What happened? What did he do? The doctor asked, rushing in through the ruined door. He swept a glance over the continuous recording dials at the foot of Brian's bed. Respiration, temperature, heart, blood pressure, all were normal. The patient lay quietly and didn't answer him. For the rest of that day, Brian had much to think about. It was difficult. The fatigue, mixed with the tranquilizers and other drugs, had softened his contact with reality. His thoughts kept echoing back and forth in his mind, unable to escape. What had Igel meant? What was that nonsense about Anvar? Anvar was that way because, well, it just was. It had come about naturally. Or had it? The planet had a very simple history. From the very beginning there had never been anything of real commercial interest on Anvar. Well off the interstellar trade routes, there were no minerals worth digging and transporting the immense distances to the nearest inhabited worlds. Hunting the winter beasts for their pelts was a profitable but very minor enterprise, never sufficient for mass markets. Therefore, no organized attempt had ever been made to colonize the planet. In the end, it had been settled completely by chance. A number of off-planet scientific groups had established observation and research stations, finding unlimited data to observe and record during Anvar's unusual yearly cycle. The long-duration observations encouraged the scientific workers to bring their families, and slowly but steadily small settlements grew up. Many of the fur hunters settled there as well, adding to the small population. This had been the beginning. Few records existed for those early days, and the first six centuries of Anvarian history were more speculation than fact. The breakdown occurred about that time, and in the galaxy-wide disruption, Anvar had to fight its own internal battle. When the Earth Empire collapsed, it was the end of more than an era. Many of the observation stations found themselves representing institutions that no longer existed. The professional hunters no longer had markets for their furs, since Anvar possessed no interstellar ships of its own. There had been no real physical hardship involved in the breakdown as it affected Anvar, since the planet was completely self-sufficient. Once they had made the mental adjustment to the fact that they were now a sovereign world, not a collection of casual visitors with various loyalties, life continued unchanged. Not easy. Living on Anvar is never easy, but at least without difference on the surface. The thoughts and attitudes of the people were, however, going through a great transformation. Many attempts were made to develop some form of stable society and social relationship. Again, little record exists of these early trials, other than the fact that they culminated in the Twenties. To understand the Twenties, you have to understand the unusual orbit that Anvar tracks around its sun, 70 Opiuchi. There are other planets in this system, all of them more or less conforming to the plane of the elliptic. Anvar is obviously a rogue, perhaps a captured planet of another sun. For the greatest part of its 780-day year, it arcs far out from its primary in a high-angled, sweeping cometary orbit. When it returns, there is a brief, hot summer of approximately 80 days, before the long winter sets in once more. This severe difference in seasonal change has caused profound adaptations in the native life forms. During the winter, most of the animals hibernate, the vegetable life lying dormant as spores or seeds. Some of the warm-blooded herbivores stay active in the snow-covered tropics, 
preyed upon by fur-insulated carnivores. Though unbelievably cold, the winter is a season of peace in comparison to the summer. For summer is a time of mad growth. Plants burst into life with a strength that cracks rocks, growing fast enough for the motion to be seen. The snowfields melt into mud, and within days a jungle stretches high into the air. Everything grows, swells, proliferates. Plants climb on top of plants, fighting for the life energy of the sun. Everything is eat and be eaten, grow and thrive in that short season. Because when the first snow of winter falls again, ninety percent of the year must pass until the next coming of warmth. Mankind has had to adapt to the Anvarian cycle in order to stay alive. Food must be gathered and stored, enough to last out the long winter. Generation after generation had adapted until they look on the mad seasonal imbalance as something quite ordinary. The first thaw of the almost non-existent spring triggers a wide-reaching metabolic change in the humans. Layers of subcutaneous fat vanish, and half-dormant sweat glands come to life. Other changes are more subtle than the temperature adjustment, but equally important. The sleep center of the brain is depressed. Short naps or a night's rest every third or fourth day becomes enough. Life takes on a hectic and hysterical quality that is perfectly suited to the environment. By the time of the first frost, rapid growing crops have been raised and harvested, sides of meat either preserved or frozen in mammoth lockers. With this supreme talent of adaptability, mankind has become part of the ecology and guaranteed his own survival during the long winter. Physical survival has been guaranteed. But what about mental survival? Primitive Earth Eskimos can fall into a long doze of half-conscious hibernation. Civilized men might be able to do this, but only for a few cold months of terrestrial midwinter. It would be impossible to do during a winter that is longer than an Earth year. With all the physical needs taken care of, boredom becomes the enemy of an Anvarian who was not a hunter and even the hunters could not stay out on the solitary trek all winter. Drink was one answer, and violence another. Alcoholism and murder were the twin terrors of the cold season after the breakdown. It was the twenties that ended all that. When they became part of a normal life, the summer was considered just an interlude between games. The twenties were more than just a contest. They became a way of life that satisfied all the physical, competitive, and intellectual needs of this unusual planet. They were a decathlon, rather a double decathlon, raised to its highest power, where contest in chess and poetry composition held equal place with those in ski-jumping and archery. Each year there were two planet-wide contests held, one for men and one for women. This was not an attempt at sexual discrimination, but a logical facing of facts. Inherent differences prevented fair contests. For example, it is impossible for a woman to win a large chess tournament, and this fact was recognized. Anyone could enter for any number of years. There were no scoring handicaps. When the best man won, he was really the best man. A complicated series of playoffs and eliminations kept contestants and observers busy for half the winter. They were only preliminary to the final encounter that lasted a month and picked a single winner. That was the title he was awarded, Winner. The man and woman who had bested every other contestant on the entire planet and who would remain unchallenged until the following year. Winner. It was a title to take pride in. Brian stirred weakly on his bed, and managed to turn so he could look out of the window. Winner on Anvar. 
His name was already slated for the history books, one of the handful of planetary heroes. Schoolchildren would be studying him now, just as he had read of the winners of the past. Weaving daydreams and imaginary adventures around Brian's victories, hoping and fighting to equal them some day, to be a winner was the greatest honor in the universe. Outside, the afternoon sun shimmered weakly in a dark sky. The endless ice fields soaked up the dim light, reflecting it back as a colder and harsher illumination. A single figure on skis cut a line across the empty plain. Nothing else moved. The depression of the ultimate fatigue fell on Brian and everything changed, as if he looked in a mirror at a previously hidden side. He saw suddenly, and with terrible clarity, that to be a winner was to be absolutely nothing, like being the best flea among all the fleas on a single dog. What was Anvar, after all? An ice-locked planet, inhabited by a few million human fleas, unknown and unconsidered by the rest of the galaxy. There was nothing here worth fighting for. The wars after the breakdown had left them untouched. The Anvarians had always taken pride in this, as if being so unimportant that no one else even wanted to come near you could possibly be a source of pride. All the other worlds of man grew, fought, won, lost, changed. Only on Anvar did life repeat its sameness endlessly, like a loop of tape in a player. Brian's eyes were moist. He blinked. Tears! Realization of this incredible fact wiped the maudlin pity from his mind and replaced it with fear. Had his mind snapped in the strain of the last match? These thoughts weren't his. Self-pity hadn't made him a winner. Why was he feeling it now? Anvar was his universe. How could he even imagine it as a tag-end planet at the outer limb of creation? What had come over him and induced this inverse thinking? And as he thought the question, the answer appeared at the same instant. Winner Igel, the fat man with the strange pronouncements and probing questions. Had he cast a spell like some sorcerer or the devil in Faust? No, that was pure nonsense. But he had done something perhaps planted a suggestion when Brian's resistance was low, or used subliminal vocalization like the villain in Cerebus Chained. Brian could find no adequate reason on which to base his suspicion, but he knew with sure positiveness that Igel was responsible. He whistled at the sound switch next to his pillow, and the repaired communicator came to life. The duty nurse appeared in the small screen. The man who was here today, Brian said. Winner Igel, do you know where he is? I must contact him. For some reason, this flustered her professional calm. The nurse started to answer, excused herself, and blanked the screen. When it lit again, a man in guard's uniform had taken her place. You made an inquiry? the guard said, about Winter Igel. We are holding him here in the hospital, following the disgraceful way in which he broke into your room. I have no charges to make. Will you ask him to come and see me at once? The guard controlled his shock. I'm sorry, Winter. I don't see how we can. Dr. Colry left specific orders that you were not to be— The doctor has no control over my personal life. Brian interrupted. I'm not infectious, nor ill with anything more than extreme fatigue. I want to see that man at once. The guard took a deep breath, made a quick decision. He's on his way now, he said, and rung off. What did you do to me? Brian asked as soon as Igel had entered and they were alone. You won't deny that you have put alien thoughts in my head. 
No, I won't deny it, because the whole point of my being here is to get those alien thoughts across to you. Tell me how you did it, Brian insisted. I must know. I'll tell you, but there are many things you should understand first before you decide to leave Anvar. You must not only hear them, you will have to believe them. The primary thing, the clue to the rest, is the true nature of your life here. How do you think the Twenties originated? Before he answered, Brian carefully took a double dose of the mild stimulant he was allowed. I don't think, he said, I know. It's a matter of historical record. The founder of the games was Giraldi. The first contest was held in 378 A.B. The Twenties have been held every year since then. They were strictly local affairs in the beginning, but were soon well established on a planet-wide scale. True enough, I Joe said. But you're describing what happened. I asked you how the Twenties originated. How could any single man take a barbarian planet lightly inhabited by half-mad hunters and alcoholic farmers and turn it into a smooth-running social machine built around the artificial structure of the Twenties? It just couldn't be done. But it was done, Brian insisted. You can't deny that. And there is nothing artificial about the Twenties. They are a logical way to live a life on a planet like this. Igel laughed a short, ironic bark. <laughs> Very logical, he said. But how often does logic have anything to do with the organization of social groups and governments? You're not thinking. Put yourself in founder Giraldi's place. Imagine that you have glimpsed the great idea of the Twenties, and you want to convince others. So you walk up to the nearest louse-ridden, brawling, superstitious, booze-embalmed hunter and explain clearly how a program of his favorite sports, things like poetry, archery, and chess, can make his life that much more interesting and virtuous. You do that, but you keep your eyes open at the same time and be ready for a fast draw. Even Brian had to smile at the absurdity of the suggestion. Of course, it couldn't happen that way. Yet, since it had happened, there must be a simple explanation. We can beat this back and forth all day, Igel told him. And you won't get the right idea unless... He broke off, suddenly staring at the communicator. The operation light had come on, though the screen stayed dark. Igel reached down a meaty hand and pulled loose the recently connected wires. That doctor of yours is very curious, and he's going to stay that way. The truth behind the twenties is none of his business, but it's going to be yours. You must come to realize that the life you lead here is a complete and artificial construction developed by societics experts and put into application by skilled field workers. Nonsense, Brian broke in. Systems of society can't be dreamed up and forced on people like that. Not without bloodshed and violence. Nonsense yourself, Igel told him. That may have been true in the dawn of history, but not any more. You have been reading too many of the old Earth classics. You imagine that we still live in the ages of superstition. Just because fascism and communism were once forced on reluctant populations... You think this holds true for all time. Go back to your books. In exactly the same era, democracy and self-government were adapted by former colonial states like India and the Union of North Africa. And the only violence was between the local religious groups. Change is the lifeblood of mankind. Everything we today accept as normal was at one time an innovation. And one of the most recent innovations is the attempt to guide the societies of mankind into something more consistent with the personal happiness of individuals. The God Complex, Brian said, forcing human lives into a mold whether they want to be fitted into it or not. 
societies can be that igel agreed it was in the beginning and there were some disastrous results of attempts to force populations into a political climate where they didn't belong they weren't all failures anvar here is a striking example of how good the technique can be when correctly applied it's not done this way any more though as with all of the other sciences we have found out that the more we know the more there is to know we no longer attempt to guide cultures towards what we consider a beneficial goal there are too many goals and from our limited vantage point it is hard to tell the good ones from the bad ones all we do now is try to protect the growing cultures give a little jolt to the stagnating ones and bury the dead ones when the work was first done here on anvar the theory hadn't progressed that far the understandably complex equations that determine just where in the scale from a type one to a type five a culture is had not yet been completed the technique then was to work out an artificial culture that would be most beneficial for a planet then bend it into the mold how can that be done brian asked how was it done here we've made some progress you're finally asking how the technique here took a good number of agent and a great deal of money personal honor was emphasized in order to encourage dueling and this led to a heightened interest in the technique of personal combat when this was well entrenched giraldi was brought in and he showed how organized competitions could be more interesting than haphazard encounters tying the intellectual aspects onto the framework of competitive sports was a little more difficult but not overwhelmingly so the details aren't important all we are considering now is the end product which is you you're needed very much why me brian asked why am i special because i won the twenties i can't believe that taken objectively there isn't much difference between myself and the ten runner-ups why don't you ask one of them they could do your job as well as i no they couldn't i'll tell you later why you are the only man i can use our time is running out and i must convince you of some other things first igel glanced at his watch we have less than three hours to deadline before that time i must explain enough of our work to you to enable you to decide voluntarily to join us a very tall order brian said you might begin by telling me just who this mysterious we is that you keep referring to the cultural relationships foundation a non-governmental body privately endowed existing to promote peace and ensure the sovereign welfare of independent planets so that all will prosper from the goodwill and commerce thereby engendered <laughs> sounds as if you're quoting brian told him no one could possibly make up something that sounds like that on the spur of the moment i was quoting from our charter of organization which is all very fine in a general sense but i'm talking specifically now about you you are the product of a tightly knit and very advanced society your individuality has been encouraged by your growing up in a society so small in population that a mild form of government control is necessary the normal anvarian education is an excellent one and participation in the twenties has given you a general and advanced education second to none in the galaxy it would be a complete waste of your entire life if you now took all this training and wasted it on some rustic form you give me very little credit i plan to teach forget anvar i shall cut him off with a chop of his hand this world will roll on quite successfully whether you are here or not you must forget it think of its relative unimportance on a galactic scale and consider instead the existing suffering hordes of mankind you must think what you can do to help them but what can i do as an individual the day is long past when a single man like caesar or alexander could bring about world-shaking changes true but not true igel said 
there are key men in every conflict of forces men who act like catalyst applied at the right instant to start a chemical reaction you might be one of these men but i must be honest and say that i can't prove it yet so in order to save time and endless discussion i think i will have to spark your personal sense of obligation obligation to whom to mankind of course to the countless billions of dead who kept the whole machine rolling along that allows you the full long and happy life you enjoy today what they gave to you you must pass on to others this is the keystone of humanistic morals agreed and a very good argument in the long run but not one that is going to tempt me out of this bed within the next three hours a point of success i shall said you agree with the general argument now i apply it specifically to you here is the statement i intend to prove there exists a planet with a population of seven million people unless i can prevent it this planet will be completely destroyed it is my job to stop that destruction so that is where i am going now i won't be able to do the job alone in addition to others i need you not anyone like you but you and you alone you have precious little time to convince me of all that brian told him so let me make the job easier for you the work you do this planet the imminent danger of the people there these are all facts that you can undoubtedly supply i'll take a chance that this whole thing is not a colossal bluff and admit that given time you could verify them all this brings the argument back to me again how can you possibly prove that i am the only person in the galaxy who can help you i can prove it by your singular ability the thing i came here to find ability i am in no way different from the other men on my planet you're wrong igel said you are the embodied proof of evolution rare individuals with specific talents occur occasionally in any species man included it has been two generations since an empathetic was last born on anvar and i have been watching carefully most of the time what in blazes is an empathetic <laughs> and how do you recognize it when you have found it brian chuckled this talk was getting preposterous i can recognize one because i'm one myself there is no other way as to how projective empathy works you had a demonstration of that a little earlier when you felt those strange thoughts about anvar it will be a long time before you can master that but receptive empathy is your natural trait this is mentally entering into the feelings or what could be called the spirit of another person empathy is not thought perception it might be better described as the sensing of someone else's emotional makeup feelings and attitudes you can't lie to a trained empathetic because he can sense the real attitude behind the verbal lies even your undeveloped talent has proved immensely useful in the twenties you can outguess your opponent because you know his movements even at his body tenses to make them you accept this without ever questioning it how do you know this was brian's understood but never voiced secret igel smiled just guessing but i won the twenties too remember also without knowing a thing about empathy at the time on top of our normal training it's a wonderful trait to have which brings me to the proof we mentioned a minute ago when you said you would be convinced if i could prove you were the only person who could help me i believe you are and that is one thing i cannot lie about it's possible to lie about a belief verbally to have a falsely based belief or to change a belief but you can't lie about it to yourself equally important you can't lie about a belief to an empathetic would you like to see how i feel about this see is a bad word there is no vocabulary yet for this kind of thing 
better would you join me in my feelings sense my attitudes memories and emotions just as i do brian tried to protest but he was too late the doors of his senses were pushed wide and he was overwhelmed dis igel said aloud seven million people hydrogen bombs brian brand those were just key words landmarks of associations with each one brian felt the rushing wave of the other man's emotions there could be no lies here igel was right in that this was the raw stuff that feelings are made of the basic reactions to the things and symbols of memory dis 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 it was a word it was a planet and the word thundered like a drum a drum the sound of its thunder surrounded and was a wasteland a planet of death a planet where living was dying and dying was very better than living dis crude barbaric backward miserable dirty beneath consideration planet hot burning scorching wastelands of sands and sands and sands and sands that burned and burned will burn forever the people of this planet so crude dirty miserable barbaric subhuman inhuman less than human but they were going to be dead and dead they would be seven million blackened corpses that would blacken your dreams all dreams dreams forever because those hydrogen bombs were waiting to kill them unless 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 you igel stopped it you igel death you death you death alone couldn't do it you death must have brian brand he wet behind the ears raw untrained brian brand to help you he was the only one in the galaxy who could finish the job as the flow of sensation died away brian realized he was sprawled back weakly on his pillows soaked with sweat washed with the memory of the raw emotion across from him igel sat with his face bowed in his hands when he lifted his head brian saw with his eyes a shadow of the blackness he had just experienced death brian said that terrible feeling of death it wasn't just the people of dis who would die it was something more personal myself igel said and behind this simple word were the repeated echoes of night that brian had been made aware of with his newly recognized ability my own death not too far away this is the wonderful terrible price you must pay for your talent angst is an inescapable part of empathy it is a part of the whole unknown field of psi phenomena that seems to be independent of time death is so traumatic and final that it reverberates back along the timeline the closer i get the more aware of it i am there is no exact feeling of date just a rough location in time that is the horror of it i know i will die soon after i get to dis and long before the work there is finished I know the job to be done there and I know the men who have already failed at it I also know you are the only person who can possibly complete the work I have started do you agree now will you come with me yes of course Brian said I'll go with you end of chapter 3